I'm excited about this guest. And in fact, I'm holding up for those of you who are watching us on video right now um, at clayandbuck.com. Bad Therapy, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up by Abigail Schreer. I am going to read this book. Uh, Buck has got his own copy as well. We get a lot of books, uh, Abigail, who is with us now. A lot of times, to be frank, I don't have the time to be able to read them. I put this on my list. My wife wants to read it. You are absolutely killing it. Um, and so I want to start with this, though, before we get into the book. Sure. You have had a similar experience as me. When American Playbook came out, it was the number one selling nonfiction book in America. It did not make the New York Times list. Your book went to number one, I believe, on Amazon, yeah. which is virtually unheard of. <laughs> it did not make one of the 15 best-selling books in America. This is one of the best endorsements of a book I can give you because to me it means the Times does not want your book to get the publicity and attention. Explain that for listeners out there who I, I think a lot of people think the New York Times just ranks the best-selling books. They don't at all. Um, what, why is this significant? And what does it say to you that they have avoided recognizing how many people are buying and reading your book? Well, you know, they don't like anybody who kicks the legs out of their narrative, right? So with the last book, they were very unhappy with me because I wrote, a, you know, about the epidemic of, tra of teenage girls deciding they were transgender. And I, you know, pointed out the risks and ar argued it was a social contagion. And the book was really successful, and that bothered the New York Times a lot because um, eventually they had to admit those risks. Uh, so in, in this book, you know, it, bad therapy really just says that, you know, the, the, the question is, why are these, why is this generation think it's so unwell? Why are they awash in diagnosis? Why are they constantly taking mental health days off of work? Why do they think uh, that they're, why are they all, why do they all have a diagnosis? Why are they all on psych meds or so many of them? And why do they never ha say they're shy? They have social phobia. They never say they're nervous. They say they have anxiety. They never say they're sad. They say they're depressed. And, and the point of the book was really to empower parents to, to stop listening to these uh, so-called experts who are really undermining parental authority, really undermining especially dad's ability to do what they think is right. Uh, it's often the men who, who, get, who have changed the most and gotten the most undermined by these so-called experts. And, and that's the last group that the New York Times ever wants to give uh, any uh, you know, power to. And Abigail, it's Buck. Thanks for being with us. Uh, to what degree do you think there's some connection uh, possibly between the fact that the psychiatric and psychologist uh, profession is by far, according to all the data, and I don't think anybody disagrees with this, the most left wing by political affiliation of any of the uh, medical specialties. I mean, to the point where now you have some of these medical associations that are going along with, and you wrote the book about uh, about you know gender identity disorder, gender dysphoria, whatever. Um, they're going along with things like men can get pregnant. I mean, they actually are going along with anti-science. How much politicization is to blame for this? Sure. So the, a lot. I mean, the group that had, remember these accrediting organizations had nothing to say when kids were heading into a second year of lock lockdown. Yes. What did they do? They showed up in Congress to warn about police tactics, climate change, right, and systemic racism. They had a lot to say about that. Now they think there's the solution to kids' mental health. You know, in, in the book, I argue they're a large part of the problem. And here's the connection to what you just raised. You know, if you have intergenerational trauma, if all kids are walking around with the trauma of their ancestors, not true, by the way, it's a lot of nonsense, but if they are, then colonialism and, and slavery are with us today. They're continue to harm these kids. Now, we know it isn't true. It hasn't been true, and I went into the research to show that it wasn't true. But, you know, the, unfortunately, a lot of good parents have been uh, undermined by the idea that they don't know what's best for their kids' mental health. And so they've been strong-armed once again into not doing what's right for their kids. Bad Therapy is the book, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up. Um and, and I am already starting to read this a little bit, um, Abigail, but, and I read your excerpt, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, um, which I thought was really interesting. And I want you to expound upon this um, because I see it at the front of the book too. 
Talk therapy can induce rumination, trapping kids in cycles of anxiety and depression. This is what some of your research has found. Social emotional learning handicaps are most vulnerable children in both public schools and private. Uh, the, the piece that I read that, that you excerpted was talking about how as parents were constantly sort of taught to ask our kids how they feel and that that is uh, making kids believe that whatever their feeling is, is their truth as opposed to, you know, teaching them that their emotions are going to vary and that it can't be the guidepost of their life. I, I thought it was so fascinating. Explain what you uncovered about that, focusing on feelings and treating them as legitimate. Sure. Focusing on feelings, which we know are inconstant and often even inaccurate guides to whether we were, have been hurt or injured or whether we're in the right Getting kids to constantly focus on their feelings is actually a recipe for misery. We know this. The psychological research shows it. We're just doing the opposite. We're going into schools, and as parents, we're doing the same thing. We're constantly asking kids, how are they feeling about this? How are they feeling about that? We're inducing a, a, a constant focus on their negative feelings. Why is it negative? Because, of course, if you ask someone constantly how they're feeling, they're actually going to produce mostly negative responses. Responses. And the reason is, in all of our, you know, thousands of wakeful seconds, most of them are not in a state called happy. They're in some kind of period of, you know, irritation, itch, uh, discomfort, worry, um, and, and getting kids to focus on those things while rather than going out and doing good, that's the opposite of what we want to be doing. But the others, another bad thing when, with things like social emotional learning, constantly asking kids about their negative feelings in school, that what I want parents to know is it naturally tees up a criticism of the parents. Why? Because parents are the ones whose job it is to keep a child safe. So if they were terribly traumatized by an incident, the next question question is, where was mom? I think the data, you mentioned dads. Um, I think the data, and I'm curious if you find this, that as dads have become less involved in two-parent households, the overall health of kids has collapsed, um, mental health in many ways. And there's this idea, and I bet you've read about it and studied it, Abigail, that lots of people, even on the left, they talk left but they live right. That is, they have <laughs> nuclear families in their own life. A yeah. lot of people wagging their finger at you on MSNBC and CNN. They are married to a woman uh, or they're married to a man. They have traditional household structures. They raise the kids in the two-parent household. And then they lecture anyone who suggests that that would be a good model, even though they're following it themselves. Where does fatherhood rank and factor in here in your research? So what father is that men are the ones who have changed the most in terms of parenting in the last generation. And here's why. All of their instincts they were told are bad for the kid's mental health. Telling a kid, you'll live, you're going to be fine, shake it off not, or knock it off, that kind of thing. That, they were told, don't do that. It's bad for their mental health, basically, that that would, that, that is the wrong way to proceed. And so the kids got no balance. They got constant empathy. They got constant, you know, eliciting of their feelings and never a sense that they would be resilient. They would be fine. And here's the other thing. They weren't told that their grandparents went through much worse. See, your grandparents, that's the only proof you've got that your genetic material is resilient. They need to hear what dad and mom and grandparents went through and great-grandparents went through. It's the only proof they've got that they can get through it, too. Abigail Schreier, the author, Bad Therapy While the Kids Aren't Growing Up is the book. Recommend you all get a copy of it now. And, and just in terms of, uh, of the therapy component of, of, of this for kids, um, how much of this do you think is also the uh, the usage of the medicalization of of childhood discontent, which we all go through at different times, right? We all skin our knee at different times. We fall off the jungle gym, although now I don't even know if there are jungle gyms anymore. Like you can't really the uh, playgrounds have changed a lot uh, from what they used to be. But by medicalizing these problems, it means that they can get at kids and indoctrinate them younger and younger. 
That's right. They get them into the mental health pipeline and they never leave. They just get more and more medication. And here's the thing. Sometimes kids are going through a bad phase. Sometimes they're going to outgrow it. And there's something else too. When you get in and delete their normal resources with medication, their normal sadness, you're also capping the happiness, the highs. You're altering, you may be deleting a sex drive in a young kid who's just starting puberty. And you're doing all the things that will make it harder for them to adjust to and cope with normal life. And that's what we're seeing, a generation that can't cope. Abigail, how much does social media play in here? Um, In terms of, I I, I talk about this on the show sometimes, one of the most staggering stats I've seen, 30% of teenage girls have thought about killing themselves in the last year. I mean, that is an unbelievable number. Obviously, that is feelings triumphing over the logic of their life because I can't imagine that 30% of, uh, of women or teenage girls are actually living in dire straits. How much of that is a function of the feelings that they get from social media and how should parents, in your mind, contemplate social media? Social media is bad. It's hurting the, this problem, no doubt. I, you know, I wrote about in the last book, uh, a social contagion of trans identification that was basically spread largely through social media. But here's the problem: the the sad things they're feeling, the sad feelings they have, the the you know, if they feel lonely and depressed, partially because of social media, we're then remediating it with mental health not giving them a better life, not taking away the phone, not curbing social media, but giving them more and more mental health interventions that aren't working. Diagnosis, medication, it's not working, it's counterproductive. Why? Because it's the life that's a problem. And the reason we know this is liberal boys from teenage teenage boys from liberal families have bet, have worse mental health sorry teenage boys from liberal families have worse mental health than teenage girls from conservative families now let me tell you the girls are on a lot more social media but the difference is in the environment the lack of authority from parents the introduction of mental health experts into the home at the first indication of sadness or a problem, all those things, and the constant surveillance of any activity, never letting these kids have real independence and, a, and trying to do you know, something in the world, even when it's dangerous like or has potential danger, like walking home from school. Those are all things that make a kid feel capable, and we're not letting him do those things. Abigail Schreier, everybody, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up, Uh, Bad Therapy, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up is the book. Abigail, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate the time. Oh, thank you. Take care.